Thank you, Paul and team. Uh, this morning, my message, as is mentioned, is taken from Luke chapter 5. Um, and my topic, really, um, is learning things from Peter. And as I read this passage some time back, I realized there are key barriers that we need to overcome to follow Jesus, and perhaps we could learn from Peter. Could we uh, <coughs> skip the slide of the passage? Next one. Thanks for reading. I also want to tell you this basic sermon outline is, is quite simple, really. Uh, I just want you to look at some background things to consider about Peter's calling. Just establish that so you can see where I'm going with this story. And then, um, then you look at the main part of the key barriers that uh, Peter had to overcome. And there are three I want to emphasize from this passage. The first is his dependence on his personal knowledge and experience. That was actually a barrier somehow. The second one, if you notice, his sinfulness and his feelings of inadequacy. And that was the second barrier. And the third one was is actually his fears and, you know, coming out of your comfort zone. And that was the third. And they all related. And at the end, of course, I want to just basically give a quick summary and suggest some applications and things to reflect on. So let's begin by looking at the background and context to consider. Now, you, it's a very short story, and, and you probably have heard it quite a number of times. But I just want to point out something interesting, that the Gospel of Luke has a different account. <clears throat> it's similar, uh, different from Mark. Um, it's, the difference is the order of the story. So what you actually find, if you look at Luke's Gospel, in chapter 4, verse 38, 39, you'll find that uh, here is recorded that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. And after that, only in chapter 5, you find that he's called by Jesus. Same, similar situation in the boat and so on. But in Mark's gospel, it's the other way around. Uh, we find actually he's called in, in Mark uh, chapter 1. His healing of Peter's mother-in-law is in Mark chapter... Uh, uh, sorry, it's just Mark chapter 4, sorry, not chapter 1. And his healing of his mother-in-law is in Mark chapter 1, verse 30 to 31. So... The order is different. So when you look at something like that, and you know those of you who read the Bible a lot and say, hey, is there a contradiction? Well, there are two options I want you to think about. I'll let you know what my option is. The two options is really is that uh, very often we find that uh, these gospel writers, what they call the synoptic gospels, they look at Mark were writing about the same incident, but often they, they emphasize it differently, so they put the order, because they're not so much interested in like, historical, chronological records, not all the time, because they just want to emphasize, and that's why you notice in some parts of the gospel, like in Matthew, a lot of teachings are put in blocks. <clears throat> the whole idea is so it's easy to understand. So we find that uh, Luke is probably here now um, writing the second option about a second calling of Peter, which is too strange. So if you look at it that way, uh, Peter was called, as in Luke, then he went back fishing, and then Jesus called him again. And, and perhaps Peter's calling was what we call a part-time calling, <clears throat> come to serve, and he just goes back to work. So there's possibilities there, right? <clears throat> and, uh, and while the story is about his disciples, I just want to focus on Peter. Okay? So which one do I choose? Actually, I choose the second one for this very simple reason. <clears throat> um, you will find that um, in Scripture, there's been quite a bit of calling. Um, they, we know from John <coughs> that uh, he went back fishing, <coughs> right? <coughs> and he called again. We know from John, too, that there were occasions where they were already following Jesus, and, and Jesus challenged them about some very difficult teaching. And then some of the disciples left. Not the twelve, and Jesus asked them, do you still want to leave me? And Peter, of course, brilliantly answered, no, where, where, who should we go to? I mean, you have the words of eternal life. And so there's this back and forth thing. <clears throat> so I want you to think of it as a second part, and I want you to think about the first thing I want to think about is uh, your calling before God. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you have uh, had felt, you know, I was called by God. I'm not talking about being a pastor or a missionary, all right? <clears throat> I'm 
called by God, and then later you walk off. Is it in your life? I, I know some people here in church, you know, yeah, I became a Christian, you know, maybe 20 years ago, and then I haven't been going to church, you know, I kind of neglected, I left God, and then suddenly I realized God calling me back, and then I came. And that was also my story. <coughs> I walked away from God for a while, uh, and then um, God called me back. <coughs> so I want to say that if you have walked away after responding to God's call, you're not, not alone, okay? God keeps calling. And I want to encourage you to know, <coughs> no matter where you are in your journey of life, God hasn't forgotten you, and He's calling you. <coughs> and we notice that calling comes in different stages of our life. Uh, many of you will know, uh, especially those who are now married. <coughs> when you were young, if you came to know the Lord when you were young, what happened after that? You were excited. You were in school and uni. And then after a while, life got busy, right? <coughs> and you kind of ne ne neglected God. You got involved in a lot of stuff. And then some people, when they get married, they're excited. And then when the children come, I've got no more time for God. It's a different phase of life. <coughs> And I want you to know God has not forgotten, okay? So that's the first thing I want to know. And I want you to notice something interesting, why I also say it's the second part. Because Peter obviously knew Jesus and his power. If you read Luke chapter 4, he knew. And it's not a, not a very large place. He would have heard about Jesus' teaching. He witnessed his power over demons. No more, let's read the gospel part. He knows his mother-in-law was healed by Jesus. So... <clears throat> He's aware. So it's nothing new. So this is struggle. And you notice too in this passage, very interesting that he reluctantly obeyed Jesus' command to cast out his nets. Right? But he still did it because he had a great respect for Jesus. Isn't that interesting? You notice then the passage, he calls Jesus master. And the word master in verse 5 actually means someone who is superior. Later, we notice in verse 8, he changes it to Lord. Something happened along the way in that encounter. <clears throat> so I want you to first think about that first, that obeying the call of Jesus is sometimes difficult. It can be very difficult. Not the eternal life part, that's the easy part, right? You know, I come, I receive that life, and it's by God's grace. But to be a disciple can be very difficult. <clears throat> because like I mentioned, sometimes we get distracted. Again, I want to remind you, as I start this sermon, that is always the opportunity to respond properly. <clears throat> when I read the scripture, I, I find amazing stories like the parable of the two sons in Matthew chapter 21. You go back and look about it, it's very interesting because the father, the parable says very simple, the father says to two sons, go and do that. And uh, uh, one son said, okay. And he goes, he doesn't do it. The second son says, no, I'm not doing it. <clears throat> he walks off. And he changed his mind and doesn't do it. <coughs> you see, the thing about it, you see, the second, that son, <coughs> I'm not doing it. I'm not going to obey. And then he had a change of heart and he did it. And what did God say? Hey. <coughs> Jesus said, honor the guy. Because God is kind of a loving God, right? <coughs> I will not. But later he obeyed. So I want to examine Peter's story from this passage and look at some of the barriers you had to overcome to get him back on the right track. <clears throat> and I hope it can be a very practical help for you to overcome your own barriers because your barriers may be different. When God calls you to do something so that when he calls, we find it easier to obey because we know the barriers and we know how to overcome them. So let's look at the first barrier. <clears throat> Peter's dependence on his personal knowledge and experience. <clears throat> Why did I say this? <clears throat> when Jesus asked him, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch, <clears throat> that was wrong advice, a wrong command, so to speak. Everything from his experience says that Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about. And I like the way this commentator describes it. Grant Osborne expresses this situation very well. So listen to what he says. Everything about this command was wrong. You fished at night, not during the day, because when the sun came up and the water started to get warmer, the fish go, they just went deeper. Not only that, 
For this deep sea fishing, they use a heavy trammel net that will need both boats and all four fishermen. Such a large net could easily be seen and avoided during the day. Fish will see it. Still, this was a very deep lake, and the nets could not go deeper than 20 feet or so. They had caught nothing that night, even at a good time for fishing, and every little detail spelled failure. And they would be justified to laugh at Jesus' request. And he mentioned something interesting. The first command put out is singular. Addressing Simon, or Simon and Peter alone, but the second let down your nets is plural. Addressing all of them in both boats. So Jesus knew something. <coughs> and everything they knew should be wrong. <coughs> but look what happened when he actually, Peter and then his fellow fishermen obeyed. And we read in verse 6, And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. You see, he had experienced firsthand the knowledge and power of God over his personal area of expertise. <clears throat> With great knowledge in this time of age we live, <clears throat> through the internet, <clears throat> through forums, through social media, I mean, everything available, the sad part is many of us actually think we know better than God. Be honest, with many of us when reading the Bible, what the Bible teaches and tells us to, to do, we often reject parts of the Bible. Why? Because we disagree with how, <coughs> how we feel about things, <coughs> how we think about things. And if you look at our country, we are following the trend in the West, right? Where practically... All the major belief systems we have <coughs> about human nature, about life, how society should work, is being thrown out <coughs> because we reject that. So it's very important for us to realize that when we do trust and obey when God calls. In this passage, Jesus calls Peter and his friends to follow him and become fishers of men. And I want to mention this now first, that when we read the Bible, I think you know that the call is for everyone to receive Jesus into your life, right? Everybody. It's important God's calling us that we trust and obey, that he will be on our side. It's a scary thing and because it, I don't know whether you know what you're doing, God. Sometimes we say that, right? And the Great Commission, we always remember chapter 29, verse 8, 19, 28. Oh, why did I write all the mistakes today? ends with, and behold, I am with you always to the ends of the age. <clears throat> I sometimes wonder when I was growing up as a younger Christian, whether God actually knows what he's doing. I don't know whether you had that feeling. My own context was quite similar. <clears throat> and finally, for example, when God gave me the call and said, okay, Paul, I want you to drop things. I want you to enter something called full-time ministry. And I said, you really, could it be crazy? I said, the context really is that I've got nothing. <coughs> and it took a while and the beginning to say, okay, I trust God that even I have nothing, <coughs> even if I'm not sure whether I've got enough to eat, I will trust you. <coughs> but <coughs> I decided I'm not going to get married because I said, I can trust you, God, with my life, but I'm not going to trust you <laughs> basically for the life of another. I, I can't marry someone and let the person suffer. And it took a long time you know, in my mind anyway, but God said, no, hey, you've got to trust me with that. And then when I said, okay, God, I, I, if I find a right person, thing, I, I think I found the right person, you're calling me, but I will never have children because if we as adults can decide this, right? That's fair, right? What about our children? See, the journey is, <coughs> is that, <coughs> that sometimes because we look on our personal experience and knowledge, we know how hard it is. <coughs> and I said, no, God, I can't. Because I think I know better than God. But obviously God knows better. <clears throat> and here's the thing. Is what authority do you choose to follow? <clears throat> and that's the crux that came to my mind. <clears throat> Peter knows his stuff. <clears throat> Jesus says, do this. It clashes. He is an authority on fishing. Jesus knows nothing about fishing. Jesus was a carpenter, a stonemason. 
But here it is, the idea is basically, do you obey God, His word, or do you obey others? <clears throat> and here's the problem we find, we, we rely on our personal preference. It's what we feel or what we currently think can be unreliable. I'll give an example. Today I notice there's a lot of peer pressure to hook up <coughs> and have a fling, right? We see it happening very often. Does it make it right to have sex outside marriage even though the pressure is there? And I tell you, many Christians will just go ahead and hook up. And yet, they say they are Christians. <coughs> it doesn't make sense. I give another example. There's a great sympathy for me personally and empathy for those struggling with gender identity. It is true, it's real. But does it make it right for us to deny there's a biological male and a biological female, and that the biological male cannot be a biological female, <coughs> no matter what you say. But the feelings there, you know what I mean? <coughs> oh, you're so hateful. Who do you believe? <coughs> Who would you follow? And the problem today, that's why you notice our church for years and years have been harping about Bible, Bible, Bible authority, theology, understanding the bus, because we disregard the authority of the Bible. We are not convinced that the Bible is reliable. <coughs> Let me give you a very quick examples. <coughs> People attack, one of the areas of attack is that the Bible is not historically accurate, right? <coughs> and through generations, even hundreds and hundreds of years ago, people are saying that we show all the evidence shows that the Bible is not accurate historically, therefore it's not reliable. <coughs> Over a hundred years ago, one of the big issues in archaeology is this terminology, this, this idea of a, a race called the Hittites. <coughs> you read through the Old Testament, you find Hittites, Hittites everywhere. <coughs> and all the evidence in archaeology shows there's no such group of people called the Hittites. So the conclusion is the Bible made it all up. <coughs> it's all a fairy tale, and therefore it's unreliable. But if you go and look any book, <coughs> Attacking Bible, I think today, <clears throat> the last 20 years, you will never find it reference anymore because so much evidence suddenly came up over the years. They found about a Hittite, the history, the, they began to realize, hey, these people really existed, and so the critics keep quiet and just shoved it under. Simple things, they'll pick on little things. One of the things, for example, is if you read through the Old Testament in Genesis, you'll find a lot of camels, <laughs> Right? Abraham wrote, you know, they were traveling in camels and camels, you know. And, and they said, no, 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 that uh, in time of Abraham's second millennial BC, there doesn't exist domesticated camels. There's no proof. In fact, all the evidence shows don't such thing. And then decades later, the critics either did not realize or they just ignored the fact that there are actually two types of camels in those days, right? Have you seen camels? <coughs> the dromedary, right, single hump, <coughs> and the Bactrian, two humps. And then they discovered the Bactrian or the two hump camels were already domesticated and used in caravans in the early 3rd millennium BC, 1,000 years before Abraham. <coughs> now, oops. <coughs> because they, got, they mixed up the camels. <coughs> Simple things like that, and the list goes on and on. But then there are also the theological issues, right? <coughs> You know, when I was growing up, <coughs> when I entered <coughs> my first year in seminary, <coughs> I almost lost my faith in God <coughs> for the simple reason, because I'm, I, I love to study, right? <coughs> and I studied and, and I couldn't accept the fact that a loving God actually created a hell. <coughs> if God is loving, why do you need hell? And I really, really struggle. I say, then what is this thing? You know, why do I serve a God who's like, seems so, you know, cruel? <coughs> why don't you just forgive? <coughs> and I struggle. <coughs> and then I understood. It's just like what we were mentioning in Habakkuk. And I could understand the whole bigger picture. So here the problem we find is there's also the problem of relying on unreliable experts. Social media experts and their opinions actually are very unreliable. I'm on a group forum and I, I get the amount of things. Sometimes I find something that seems to be very true 
And I just end up to my friends and say, hey, what do you think of this? And then some genius will come and say, I can show you why this is false <coughs> or this is thing. We accept. <coughs> Both Christians and non-Christians are just equally as guilty. <coughs> I mean, when faced with what the Bible states, it is frightening that most of us accept as truth. Without critical analysis, what we see and hear on things like TikTok videos. <coughs> TikTok videos <coughs> is the truth. <coughs> you don't believe me? Look at the current Palestinian, or should I say Hamas and Israel war. You to and fro, both sides are giving a lot of nonsense. There are a few videos coming on there, they're not accurate. They leave out certain facts <coughs> to bolster up what we believe. <coughs> and here's the thing, guys. <coughs> you know why I've been pushing Logos Bible software? We depend too much on locating sources for Bible study on Google. <coughs> I'm not saying there's not good stuff out there. To filter a lot of stuff, I tell you, ridiculous things they're teaching there, questionable and also false. And we build our theology on Google, on Wikipedia. I'm not saying all things are bad there. There's some great stuff, no. But who writes it? That's what's happening. <clears throat> you see, he's part of the thing where he's confronted with this thing about... Jesus, what do I follow? I'm dependent on my personal knowledge, my experience. Why do I depend on God and God's word? <clears throat> so all I'm saying is when expert knowledge seems to contradict the Bible or God's commands, why is it that as Christians we don't give God's word the benefit of the doubt? <clears throat> because each time the Bible is attacked, new discoveries always turn up to support the reliability of the Bible. And we'll be throughout the Bible and we don't take it seriously. That's where all problems start. Does it make sense? <coughs> the second barrier <coughs> that Peter has overcome is this whole idea of his sinfulness and his feelings of inadequacy. Because he knows he's not the greatest guy in the world. We all know that. But when he was confronted with Jesus' holiness, when he saw Jesus' power and he realized that, you know what God told me to do, this Jesus fellow told me to do, Broke all my expectations. He's wrong every way, but yet a miracle happened. He cannot be right. Everything I know about fishing, every, all my experience tells me it shouldn't work, but it worked. And then he realized more than that, this is trouble God. He couldn't fully understand it, but then he went out, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. He don't say that to ordinary people. He knew something. Because it's humanly impossible for the number of fish. And that's why I say, interestingly, he referred to Jesus with great respect, Master, <coughs> Superior, and he changed it to Lord. Not just Superior, Lord just means not Superior, but it's Superior in stature and authority. Authority came in. <coughs> he had a glimpse of Jesus' holiness, a first glimpse into the fact that this Jesus is God. And you know how important it is because we read through the Gospels as they see the thing develops. Any Jew holds on to the first thing, right? There's only one God. Shema, you don't, there's no, no such thing. They can't understand. You cannot accept this Jesus as God. But they didn't have any issue in question because they knew. <clears throat> he realized he was not worthy to be in Jesus' presence, much less even to serve him. He was so overcome with this sense of sinfulness and his inadequacy. I'm nobody. But here's the beautiful part the realization that we are sinful and we are not worthy is what makes us worthy to be called. Strange. <coughs> realize too that holiness of God is central <coughs> to understanding the gospel. Jesus, in John chapter 16, verse 8 onwards, he, this is what he says. Let me just read verse 8. And when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. <coughs> See the idea of sin? 
Judgment is so core to the gospel. That is part of it. We need to realize we're sinners, and that God is holy, that sin will be judged. But also, that despite all that, God still calls us because of His love and His grace. We are not just called to be saved, is it right? But to serve and to spread this good news that others may be saved. He will empower us because He calls us. What did He say to Peter? Please do not be afraid. <coughs> Verse 10. There is power and grace in our calling. See, the more you realize your unworthiness and weakness, the more you experience grace. Don't you, re- don't you see that? <coughs> Have you noticed that in your life? The more inadequate you feel as you serve and you want to follow God, the more you actually experience grace. One of my favorite passages from Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Let me read that to you. He said to me, he just told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. <clears throat> Have you not experienced that? You will only experience this when you actually are serving. <clears throat> right? You notice that? When God calls you, it does not mean no problems. And I like this phrase I'm going to put. This calling to fish was both a success and near disaster. Why? Because it was successful, but near disaster, the nets were overflowing, the danger to the nets and the boats. It's a scary little thing, right? But he said, don't be afraid. See, we're all going to make mistakes, and we're going to have challenges, but God will be there to help us. I've seen it my whole life, even before this move to this full-time ministry, you know, become pastor and all that kind of stuff. I've seen that happening. I make so many mistakes. <coughs> Said so many wrong things. Made bad judgment calls. <coughs> and after that, I feel like, oh man, <laughs> God, I'm definitely not fit for this. <coughs> but by His grace, He just picks up and says, okay, hey, we learn, right? <coughs> Your heart is right before me. You're doing your best, you learn. I will help you. My grace, now learn to depend on me rather than your own smart thinking. It happens, right? The third barrier Peter had overcome was this. His fear of leaving his comfort zone. That's why he said, do not be afraid. Because it's not so much now, I I want to follow, but hey, (laughs) it's scary, right? See, Peter had to be willing to leave everything behind and follow Jesus. And to follow Jesus for this new idea of being fishers of men is totally different. <clears throat> Something out of his comfort zone. Something he has no knowledge about. A little, little bit. Something is definitely not an expert. If you look at Peter's life in the Bible, you see how many times he messed up. Right? He was famous for messing up. <clears throat> how many times did Jesus scold him? <clears throat> Even calling, get thee behind me, Satan. Oh dear. I'm supposed to be the leader. And after Jesus resurrected, the Holy Spirit came. And what did he do? Apostle Paul comes and starts scolding him. You hypocrite, basically. You, you, you. <clears throat> Yet, God used him. His call was to trust and obey Jesus as Lord. And I want you to remember something, why it was so difficult. Because don't think he's just like, oh, he's just country bumpkin. So it's okay, we just train him, you know. No, no, he was actually an accomplished fisherman. He was a husband. He had a business because, remember, he can go back to it later. But he had to adapt to a new lifestyle. He had to learn new things. He's no longer in charge. You see, when God calls you, it is difficult. I, I, I remember when I came to seminary, I had a few things I knew God wanted me to do. And then one of the things suddenly he said, look, I want you out of the spur, I want you to go and leave where you're starting a city and I want you to go to the jungles. I said, what? No, no, not me. <laughs> it's almost like, okay, but you don't have to be living there all the time. You know, live nearby, but you can stay a few days and things. And I was supposed to teach in a language. That's why somebody was teasing me today, better learn Mandarin. Pastor saying, if I'm called, I think I have to learn it. But 
And I do it in Malay. Now, Malay is not my language. In fact, for those who understand Malay, if you look at our, the way academic system is, this, you just look at numbers. One, two means distinction. Three, four, five, six <coughs> credits. Seven and eight are passes of the worst scale. Eight is the worst scale. I've taken my exams again, and again, I've got, only got eight. And now I'm supposed to go and teach. <coughs> I can't understand even the government document. I'm supposed to teach and preach. Man, it was really, really hard. But you know, the wonderful thing is, I, to this day, that's 30 over years ago, they tell me some of my notes that I created, they're still using. Can you imagine that? <coughs> I don't know how. Now you ask me, you give me a document, ask me to read, don't ask me, please, I can't interpret for you, translate. Seriously, it's tough. But God enabled. I don't know how, but he did. You see what I'm trying to say, it's comfort zone. So what happens then in your comfort zone when you obey God and leave our fears at his feet and step out in faith? <coughs> God will work wonders. I want to share two stories from history. <coughs> two of my heroes, <coughs> of many heroes. Some of you know the guy called William Carey. He's known as the father of modern missionaries. His life is very simple. Summarize, apprentice cobbler, not even a cobbler. <coughs> a apprentice cobbler fixes shoes, bends shoes, big, makes shoes. And God called him. <coughs> he said, I want you to go to India, reach the loss. 1700s, uh, mind you. <coughs> you just don't fly over there. He doesn't speak Hindi. He doesn't speak Tamil, doesn't speak odd. Okay. And he had this call and he went to this thing. This is the most, one of the most famous stories of his life. At a meeting of Baptist leaders in the late 1700s, a newly ordained minister, there's a guy, stood to argue for the value of overseas missions. He was abruptly interrupted by an older minister who said, Young man, sit down. You are an enthusiast. When God pleases to convict the heathen, he'll do it without consulting you or me. So basically, shut up and sit down, young fellow. What do you know? <coughs> Did he give up? No. <coughs> God called me. He had little education. We know that for a fact. But he borrowed a Greek grammar and taught himself New Testament Greek. Then he helped form a missionary society. Then he went to India. From an apprentice cobbler, he became a printer, a social reformer, a Bible translator, the entire Bible into all of India's major languages and parts of 209 other languages and dialects. He became a professor of languages and even founded a Bible college, among other things. <coughs> Apprentice cobbler. And this is one of the great phrases of his mortal life. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things from God. Do it. <coughs> He changed the way people thought about missions. And he earned the respect of Hindus, people who don't believe in Jesus. What about this guy, Lauren Cunningham? Some of you might know who he is. He's called the man who launched millions on short-term missions. You know all your short-term mission ideas? <coughs> Came from this guy. He recently died at age 88, 7 October, earlier this month. He sends a call to ministry at the age of 13. And he was started to serve God. <coughs> he had a vision and a call from God when he was just 20 years old during a time of prayer. <coughs> See, another call. <coughs> he was calling, he was serving, doing what he can. At age 20, God said, hey, <coughs> I have to pray. I want you to do something greater. And he founded an organization called Youth with a Mission, YWAM, in 1960. Today, YWAM has over 20,000 staff in 880-plus countries. <coughs> he changed <coughs> the face of understanding of missions. See, our call may be significantly smaller in vision and comfort level, but it's not necessarily less significant. So ask the question, is what is God wanting you to do? <coughs> Where you are, whether you're young or old, teenager or someone in your 80s, what is God telling you to do? See, the barrier of our dependence on our personal knowledge, experiences, and expertise is real. That's a real barrier because we think, no, no, I know better. It cannot be done this way. It has to be done this way. It's real. 
But if God is telling you to do it, <coughs> He's going to overcome it. Then the barrier of our sinfulness and feelings of inadequacy is real, isn't it? Because we feel, I, I can't, you know, I'm really not good. How am I going to be a leader in church, in a ministry and things when I'm like that? And then there's the barriers of fears and the difficulty of stepping out of our comfort zone because it just means a radical change in your thinking. <coughs> I've always told people, one of the things you've got to understand is this. <coughs> when you have a lot of money and you can read it from all the people in history, the great men and women of God, you have a certain lifestyle. <coughs> when you double your income, should your lifestyle change to be very lavish? So I'm not saying, oh, no, nah, don't treat yourself to that great holiday or that, that, that restaurant or that, that play you need to go. I, mean, I never got a chance for 30 years. I need to go. Go. But if our whole lifestyle changes <coughs> and the giving to God remains the same, <coughs> there's something really wrong, isn't it? <coughs> I want to give you a few more reflections to think about <coughs> and to pray about when you feel or think God is calling you, all right? <coughs> First thing is this. Do you know you're never called to do it all by yourself? Look at the passage again, verse 4 and verse 10. The first command, remember I mentioned, put out is singular and dressing who? Simon Peter. Alone. The, the second one, let down the nets, is plural. Addressing all of them in both boats. <coughs> the calling is there, but God always provides people. <coughs> the verb, you will be catching men, is singular. Him, but the context to them is plural. <clears throat> you know, was Peter, you're gonna lead the way, but yeah, I'm calling them to, to help you. That's why we find that though he was speaking to Peter, right? And though Peter was the one who responded, you know, I'm a sinner, I'm a basically stay away. I'm not worthy. The calling was for the others, and the others also answered the call. So we are always meant to have others in partnership in ministry. And that's why, again, sometimes people ask the new people come to church, well, why has the church got, you know, the senior pastor above? It's like, not people tell me, oh, Paul, you're the senior pastor. I laugh at them and say, I'm only senior because I'm getting older. <coughs> we believe in the plurality of leadership <laughs> because there's not one man calling the shots. It's a group of men working together and then we are accountable to a group of men and women <coughs> who check on us and have a right and a responsibility to check on us. We do it together. See, even the Apostle Paul, that man of God, had partners, fellow workers. Right? You see, Troy, he always traveled with us. He always had people with him. And his first Corinthians chapter 12, you know, the imagery we love so much of the body of Christ, what does it tell you? The body needs all the parts. <coughs> see, your past experience or knowledge of others who has stepped out in faith may seem scary. You may feel too sinful to serve. You may feel inadequate in terms of knowledge or abilities. But you need not be afraid because God will always provide support when He calls you. The second one I tell you thing is this. This is very exciting, really. Do you know we are called to help save lives? Like Peter, we are called to this save lives. It's a great calling. It should excite us. And here's some Greek for you, which I found fascinating, okay? <clears throat> the verb zogreo here means to capture alive, as in you will catch people alive. So this is a new kind of fishing and a new catch of fish, reversing the Old Testament metaphor for judgment and switching to a hunting image for rescuing people from danger and death. So they will be engaged in an entirely new kind of fishing which will turn people from death of sin to the new life in Christ. It's a very positive thing. So what greater calling can there be to be used by God to change lives for eternity? See, sharing the good news and being fishers of men, fishers of women, is the calling of everyone. It's not just for the evangelist, not for the missionary, not just for the pastor. It's for everyone. <coughs> we see confirmed throughout the Bible. We're called to be disciples, and the end of Matthew tells us the Great Commission is for all of us. <coughs> there are more than 12 disciples, right? 
There were 120 up in the room, and there were people going all over the place. Everyone is serving in a different capacity, in a different area. Here's the thing I want to help you, two more things so you're not so scary. You read the phrase, they left everything, right? <clears throat> now, following Jesus in the call to be fishers of men does not mean you have to give up all your possessions. <clears throat> that was my understanding at first. <clears throat> and that's why it was so difficult. <clears throat> it was so difficult. And for those who already know my story, it's literally I'm living hand to foot. Seriously. Beg for my salary at the beginning of the month because I'm not enough. When I came to New Zealand, now you know the story. By the time I finished everything, I came here, I set everything there. Only $1,000 in my name. I start again. When I start again, when I first entered ministry, I had 1000 ringgit in my name. Start a married. You know, and, and I said, oh, well, okay, I got a sacrifice. But then I realized God promised that he would look after. This is one of the big fears. Okay? Look at the wider context. And when they had bought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. But look at the context that Peter still kept his own home. Right? Peter's home. <laughs> that's why those who go to Israel, they say, yeah, that's where he stayed. <clears throat> John 21, remember, it tells us that the fishermen, disciples kept their boats because when they were so depressed about the fact that, oh, what happened to Jesus? is risen, he's gone. I don't know what else to do. They actually went back to their business. They still had the business to go back to. So don't think of leaving everything like Francis of Assisi, who rejected all earthly possessions. That may be the call, but hardly ever. The rich young ruler in the Bible was told to sell everything, right? And follow Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus explained his possessions was the greatest hindrance. <coughs> he won't let go of that. So Jesus Chan, you then drop everything. If you're really serious, then you follow me. And he went away sorrowful. So God doesn't call us to do that. Only a select few are asked to give up everything. And even so, God will provide. <coughs> you see example after example. And God does provide, I can tell you as your pastor, from my life experience, and that of other friends. <coughs> okay? Last reflection. I want to add something more personal. <clears throat> Again, I want to emphasize there's a general call for all of us to follow, all right? To follow Jesus, be his disciples, to be fishers of men, and to share the gospel. It's for everybody. There's no clause that says, oh, for you, okay. <clears throat> Anyone who knows Jesus is asked to call. Why? You're sharing <clears throat> your new life. But then, don't mix up with this coming call, a specific call. <coughs> this is more specific. <coughs> it's to serve in a certain form of ministry. It may not be full-time. <coughs> like Lucas felt, <coughs> Sabrina felt like, next year, look, even though we're going to get married, you know, we, need, we feel a real calling that we want to be back in youth. <coughs> Go for it. Jonathan and Laura always feel this great calling because of their creativity and what they have, saying we want to do like party. Right? We feel this is important and it's been a blessing. <coughs> right? <coughs> Paul Lavin comes in there, <coughs> takes over after he acclimatized our church and says, He's gifted in that. I've got this thing. I say, Hey, <coughs> would you take it up? He never said, I want to do it. <coughs> yeah, we pray. Yes, I think we're going to do this. Andrew was called to do creation ministries. <coughs> Why? Events and things. Everyone is called to do something. Some people there didn't want to become an elder, I can tell you. <laughs> but God kept saying yes. <coughs> but see, as I will respond. Different people are called. Some are called to do alpha, some are called to do bish, some are called to serve. You know, there are so many people serving in the kitchen. It's just a passion. You see the joy in your face. Some are be an usher. Some, it's, it's what God calls, okay? <coughs> and He will lead and support and provide the gifts you need. Okay. It is God who gives the gifts. So sometimes, think about it this way. We have the ability and gifts, so therefore we enter that ministry, right? But not all the time. 
Sometimes when God says you do it and you tell people, I feel inadequate. But God says, I want you to do it because you feel inadequate. And I'm going to help you. And then suddenly they find as the years go by, God has provided all the gifts. Isn't it amazing? But mine was to be a pastor <coughs> and later to come to New Zealand. So my calling is different. It's no greater than anybody's calling. It's just, I'm just following what God tells me to do. Okay? And here's the thing I want to mention. <coughs> Specific callings can be stressful <coughs> and require faith. But I want to make very clear because I've seen this mistake happen in people who feel God's call. <coughs> they go into it and end up in disaster, all right? The reason is this. <coughs> God will never ask you to compromise any clear biblical teaching. This is one area that will help you determine whether God's call upon your life is real or from the devil. <coughs> okay? I've shared with you before, it's been worth sharing, <coughs> calling for this person to divorce his wife, <coughs> marry this woman to this ministry, because God told him in the dream that this is the woman's going to be. Whether he's lying, <coughs> okay, this is a senior minister, okay, a friend, my friend's father. Either He's a big liar trying to find a way, use God to go and divorce, divorce his wife and marry this other woman. Or he really saw a vision as an idiot of a pastor to disobey God's command. And I told my friend, I said, you, I don't accept that. You're only 20, what do you do? My father said, okay, fair enough. <coughs> Scripture. Do you know how <coughs> applying to come here is very interesting? <coughs> This is a personal story I'll let you know. <clears throat> a lot of things went wrong at the last stage. <clears throat> was this. My application didn't go to Singapore <clears throat> embassy. It went to Bangkok <clears throat> due to a very strange series of events and not a single applicant to come to New Zealand from Malaysia goes to Bangkok. Everyone goes to Singapore. So they had no idea what to do. <clears throat> okay? Very complicated. If I were to shift it back to Singapore, I would never make it here because to start off process again. Okay, I was very foolish to think it took six months. Then he told me, actually, it takes six months minimum. <coughs> Probably takes a year. So, oh, and already things went wrong and I restarted. I've got about three months to redo. I had to beg the person, please <coughs> consider my case, what went wrong. Okay, the last stage was this. <coughs> I was asked to submit all my income tax forms, <coughs> submissions, <coughs> and I we want originals, right? And I said, I don't have originals, then we want certified copies of the originals. <coughs> now, <coughs> for those who live in Malaysia, you know, what we call the EA form, you cannot even use a photocopy to put in your details. The government will reject it, right? You need the original copies. So the only copies I have is a photocopy of what I've submitted for my records. <coughs> and I explain it <coughs> to the officer. And she said, Paul, after all the things we were going through, my supervisor says, if you don't give a certified copy, your application <coughs> stops. So I said, this is my reason. She said, look, you're in Malaysia. It's very simple. <coughs> okay? In Malaysia, you just take your copy, go to someone, you pay the person, they'll certify for you, right? Corruption. <coughs> and he said, I'm helping you. That's the only way because the, it's very clear. <coughs> I sat down, I didn't even tell my wife at the time, and I said, <coughs> God, I know you're calling me to New Zealand. I'm quite clear now, very clear. So all I need to do is this. And I said, I can't do it. <coughs> so I actually emailed the person and said, Mrs. Ladawan, I want to thank you so much for all the help you give me all the way. I just cannot do this. I said, why? Because it's wrong. And I said, you know, I, I'm a Christian. In fact, I'm going over to be a pastor. And even though I know this is a system, there isn't, doesn't exist original copy. So I definitely cannot do I cannot start my new life in a lie. And I want to thank you. And she said, do you know what that means? I said, yes, I know. It's over. I said, thank you very much. I appreciate the help. I went back and I cried. <coughs> I cried. I said, God, I've already, <coughs> I left my job. <coughs> I've sent my furniture and stuff over. <coughs> I've got nothing. Why did you do this to me? <coughs> and then the voice came and God said, well, 
this is the right thing to do. I said, yeah, it's the right thing to do. I'd rather obey you and be honest before God. And I said, and three or four days later, I got an email <coughs> from this lady, very kind lady, a Thai lady. She said, Paul, let you know something. I thought about what you said, and I actually went to see my supervisor and explained what you said. She said, hmm, that's interesting. She actually took the time, this supervisor of New Zealand, she actually took the time to ring <coughs> the Singapore embassy and ask, hey, what do you think of this? And they said, yeah, the fellow is right. You don't exist. And she said, look, though the rules say this, we understand the circumstances and you are right, and therefore we accept <coughs> your copies as genuine. And then I realized one thing. If she had checked, and my, this fellow lady had asked, and they find that I forged it, what do you think will happen? I won't be here. New Zealand is very, very strict immigration. And, and so you see, thank God. So what I'm trying to say is if God calls you, don't take shortcuts. Look at the scripture for Abraham and things, how they took shortcuts. It never worked out well. Okay? If God calls you, you will do it the right way. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, thank you. <coughs> and ask you to help us, Lord, to overcome our barriers through faith and believing. When you call us to check these things out, knowing that you really call us, you will help us. You will give us the faith. You will surround us with the right people. You will help make it true. Help us to look at your word and really be honest with your word and trust your authority in all things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Can we have the benediction, please?